I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Russell Library at the University of Georgia and Young Harris College. Our guest is Karen Handel, a former chair of the Fulton County Commission, former Georgia Secretary of State, and a Republican candidate for governor. Welcome. I'm Welcome. delighted to be here. Thank you. You were sweet to ask. Well, we're honored to have you. You're a native of the Washington area. I am. Tell us about your early life there. Well, let's see. I grew up in a small town in um, Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and my dad was a, uh, a county worker. He worked for the county government doing uh, road work, so he always marveled that when I went to the Fulton County Commission that his daughter would grow up and be dealing with sewers and, and <laughs> roads and such. Um, and um, I have one brother and one sister. My brother is uh, just not quite a year younger, and my sister is eight years younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom um, was a stay-at-home mom. My sister was very ill when she was first born, so that had a, obviously a huge impact on the family. Uh, went to Frederick Douglass High School, graduated from there, and mm -hmm. uh, did move out when I was 17. Life uh, talked about this a great deal on the campaign, and um, so much was always made of, you know, uh, Karen's work background and education mm -hmm. background and but I did leave home at 17 my mom was um, she was not a well woman she had a very serious alcohol problem and it was a real strain and no surprise with teenage daughter and mom that can um, get um, contentious and it was for the best and I was very very lucky a family let me live with them and finish up high school and graduate with my class and then I had my first job at AARP so if you can imagine <laughs> being just 18 and I worked at AARP so I'd be out with my friends what do you where do you work AARP <laughs> <laughs> um, from there I, I worked for a short time in a law firm and then I had a um, the great fortune of just really on a lark answering a job interview or a job ad in the newspaper because back in the day that's where you look for your jobs not like today and it was for Hallmark Cards working for a woman named Ray Evans um, who is from Georgia and um, it must have just been uh, my path because this woman has had a major impact on my life mm -hmm. and was my connection to Georgia, my first connection to Georgia, and who would have ever known that fast forward from my time and my husband and I would be living here in Georgia and I have the extraordinary honor and privilege of serving the people of this state. Good. You, wor you worked with Marilyn Quayle. I did, I did. When I worked at Hallmark, um, Hallmark was a corporate sponsor for uh, the Komen Breast Cancer Foundation's Race for the Cure, and so was involved in that first Washington Race for the Cure, and at that time, uh, Marilyn was looking for, Dan had just become vice president, and she was trying to find an issue to be involved in, and um, it uh, turned out that Marilyn's mom had, who was a physician, died of breast cancer at just 56, and so and she was involved in the race and then was looking for um, a youngster to come over to the White House and work with her on that issue and my boss recommended me, Ray recommended me to Marilyn and honestly I, I loved her when I met her but I really loved my job at Hallmark more and I thought I would stay at Hallmark and Ray set me straight on that really quick and um, so I had the the honor of working for the Quails. I was a deputy chief of staff and uh, spent the full four years with them and worked on the transition and what an experience for um, a young person to be able to have that opportunity to work in the White House and be pr privileged to work with such really terrific people who mm -hmm. were, um, forget people's political persuasions, I think, you know, with the benefit of hindsight now two individuals who were extraordinarily um, maligned in a really malicious way and mm -hmm. you know not over their politics but just over who they were and I think um, as history moves on it will um, show what really fantastic individuals both of them are. So what happened after that? Well let's see I met my husband during that time and in fact we got married um, the Saturday after I call it the Bush quail debacle, the re-election, but the Saturday after, and uh, Marilyn thought I was absolutely um, a lunatic to try to have a wedding <laughs> five days after the uh, campaign. But we did, and it was fantastic. And um, Steve is just, I was saying earlier, he is truly a prince among men, and 
I just am one of the most fortunate women out there and and um, he got a job offer here um, in Georgia and that's what brought us here I guess 18 it'll be 18 years because we'll be married 20 in November so 18 years ago mm -hmm. and um, came here and um, again answered a, an ad in the newspaper to go work for <laughs> KPMG as their Southeast Area Director of uh, uh, Public Relations and Community Affairs and that was working for Neil Purcell who is um, an extraordinary businessman and I mean I look back on my life and one of the I think the keys to success for me has been that I've just been so fortunate and blessed to have great mentors throughout the course of my career and um, like Ray, Neil has had um, a, just a, an amazing impact on my life. He um, ha is such a, um, a terrific business leader in this community and was chairman of the Georgia Chamber and again for a, a young person brand new to Georgia to have the opportunity to work with such a distinguished business leader in the community was um, just a fantastic opportunity and in that job a couple years later is where I met uh, Glenn Bradley who was then the CEO of SEBA Vision and um, over the course of some projects with KPMG um, landed a position with them doing um, global uh, public relations and a little bit of public policy work for them and Glenn and, and my direct boss Tim Barraby who is the uh, CFO um, again just great individuals to learn from and kind of interesting to be the sort of the words gal that came from an accounting background to report to the numbers guy and it gave me a really solid background in um, finances and how to read P&L statements and what to look for and how to translate financial information into layman's terms so that everybody could understand what portion of their job applied to the bottom line for whatever the organization is. Um, and then from there I went to the North Fulton Chamber of Commerce um, which was um, sort of going to be my job I thought I would stay at for a really, really long time. Steve and I um, were trying to have a family and at SEBA Vision I was traveling about, I don't know, close to 100,000 miles a year on Delta, which is not so conducive to having a family. Um, and sadly and unfortunately that didn't really work out. And But when I went to uh, the chamber, it was only a couple of months into the job, thankfully, with that great financial training that I got. Discover the finance director had been embezzling money for about seven years before I got there, and the organization was literally on the brink of bankruptcy and um, uh, really difficult circumstances. And probably my sort of my first, I would say, um, uh, connection to ethics and um, what needs to happen in, in the workplace and, and how you do your job from an ethics standpoint. Because one of the things that happened there, Bob, is that here was an individual. It, it had to be known in a small organization by some of the colleagues there that something wasn't quite right. But everyone turned a blind eye to what was going on. And in doing that, it went on for such a long period of time that it nearly bankrupted the organization. Mm -hmm. um, but it was hard work. and. Um, ultimately got things turned around and um, and it was during that time that I met Mike Ken who was chairman of the Fulton County Commission at the time and mm -hmm. he and his chief of staff Rob Sims who would go on to and remains today um, one of my closest friends and um, confidants and they we were talking about who might run for that District 2 post at um, Fulton County on the Fulton County Commission. And so as head of the chamber, we talked about business people, and I thought they wanted to know who the chamber might like to see in that job. And so I had came to my meeting with a list of folks that would be really good and all that. And um, they said, no, 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 no. And Rob, one of his catchphrases, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. So what he said, we want you to run. This was when? 2002. This would have been 2002. Mm -hmm. right. And I said, oh, no, no, no. That's just not real. And I went home. I didn't really think much more of it. And that night, Steve and I were chatting. He said, well, what's going on in your day? And I said, I had the weirdest lunch. With, you know that guy who's Mike Kent's chief of staff? Yeah, yeah, that guy. I said, yeah, they think I should run for county commission. Steve thought about it, cocked his head, and said, hmm, I can kind of see you doing that. And so 
off I went. I didn't have a clue in the world what I was doing either. I had no idea. Maybe if I did, it's probably a, a key thing for someone thinking about running the first time. Mm-hmm. Kind of the less you know about politics the very first time, the better, because if you knew it all, you might not <laughs> run at all. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So they, they, but that was not a good outcome. No, it wasn't. But um, you know, I I think I lost by about three thousand thirty five hundred votes. I have a real knack for those little close races yeah. there. <laughs> um, but I, you know, but in fairness, I lost to Rob Pitts, Commissioner Pitts, and you'll recall he was just coming off of his uh, runoff against then um, Mayor Shirley Franklin, and mm-hmm. again, not being pretty green about all of it didn't occur to me that here was a guy who had, I mean, they spent tens of millions in TV ads, so he had name ID, mm-hmm. you know, out, off the charts, and I had none. I mean, absolutely zero. I mean, I bet I didn't even have 5% name ID, so for, you know, some, you know, random upstart whippersnapper to come in and score within 3,500 votes or so, not so bad. Well, uh, Fulton County is very democratic. Um. You know, I, I think so, and and you know, it, I think it obviously, you know, for uh, talk a little bit about politics. I mean, you know, it's sort of this misnomer that you know women aren't really conservatives, and I am um, a diehard conservative, but I I think that there's an ability for women to kind of reach out a little bit better, a perception of it. I don't know if it bears out in reality or not, but just sort of this this perception, and so, but that. Uh, allowed me an opportunity that race to meet Sonny Perdue, mm-hmm. who then would be um, the first Republican governor in, what, over 130 years, and um, had the opportunity to serve as one of his deputy chiefs of staff mm-hmm. um, early in his administration. And But it was not, an, it was only, I want to say four months or so into it, uh, maybe six, that Mike Ken um, decided to resign the chairmanship. Mm-hmm. And you know, then it was almost a natural who it would be a special election, which mm-hmm. was obviously um, um, a significant advantage for me, having just run mm-hmm. um, a pretty high-profile race, and um, in the end decided to run for that and won. I, I don't know, I don't remember, but won pretty handily in a mm-hmm. I don't know four or five person race and mm-hmm. um, that was a nonpartisan race mm-hmm. yes yes yep but we very much ran that race um, making no bones about the fact that I was um, a longtime Republican and ran it very much as you know Karen is the Republican in the race mm-hmm. um, and you know like I said won pretty handily and pulled in a great deal of the buckhead vote um, that I had not gotten before mm-hmm. Let's talk for a minute about political uh, parties in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been, uh, the, the Republican Party had a rapid emergency, emer- emergence mm-hmm. into, into power. Tell us a little bit about how that happened. I know you must have been involved. You know, I, I think a little bit, you know, remember I've, I'm from North Fulton where it's been, you know, solidly Republican for really quite some time. Um, But, you know, you had from the state party's perspective, first with um, uh, when Ralph Reed was GOP chairman, and then, uh, um, you know, you had people like Rusty Paul and then Fred Cooper and Eric Tannenblatt, sort of the the Coverdale folks. And then you bring into that Sue Everhart, who really pulled in um, a lot more of the women. And, you know, it was really, you know, a a steady march. You know, people like Tom Price, now Congressman Tom Price, who were really there um, in the trenches to sort of move things forward and go out and identify um, solid Republicans. And especially even, you know, people like me who could be in county commission roles, who could get primed to run either for legislature or um, statewide offices. And it was very methodical with um, a lot of people, you know, working from that um, state party perspective. Alec Point event, um, I'm sure I'm leaving off a whole host of people. Who, uh, Nick Ayers, I think, you, you know, mm-hmm. you can't um, discount the impact that Nick um, during his time with Sonny Perdue had. Um, and, you know, that legislative um, uh, strategy, you know, right there with redistricting, um, to pull those seats in, and they worked really hard to recruit in solid candidates. And then once it was really close, you know, the legislature, what would that have been, the, going into the third year for Governor Purdue, um, 
went in and systematically identified those Democrats who leaned fairly conservative and maybe were feeling out of sorts with the more liberal side of the Democratic Party and went after them to pull them over into the Republican ranks. And the one thing I'll say about it, it will remain to be seen if that sort of migration, especially in the last, I would say, two years, if this was a migration of true Republicans from a, um, an issues and policy standpoint, or have we inadvertently undermined the GOP with a lot of individuals who are nothing but politically gratuitous? So you know, that will be interesting to see how that plays I out. I was going to ask that question. Uh, how, how does a long-time, hard-working Republican feel about Democrats who switch parties just to be elected? I mean, I, I won't make an assumption about how other people feel about it. I'll tell you how I feel about it. You know, it is one thing if you look at um, an individual's voting record and you see uh, where they are in their heart and soul on policy issues that they make the switch. Because I do believe that the Republican Party needs to be an open, broad party in order to sustain ourselves in the long haul. Um, but there is sort of this air of political expediency right now, especially in the last two years coming into this next round of redistricting where Georgia has trended so heavy Republican. And, you know, we all have to keep in mind that pendulum kind of swings both ways and in the end, you know, the public, the electorate, citizens, what they care most about is making sure that you have, I think what they care most about, is a productive uh, government that really uh, gets things done and, you know, less about, you know, political squabbling, whether it be uh, inter-party or intra-party squabbling. Mm -hmm. It is, how do we get this economy moving again? You know, how are we going to sustain the HOPE scholarship for the long term? Not just these short little band-aids um, that keep putting being put on it. Dealing ultimately with the budget and the tax structure and, you know, finally education in general. Um, you know, it's not lost on me that here I sit in the UGA Alumni Center and I think about um, the really extraordinary university system, both public and private, that we have here in the state of Georgia. And then you look at K through 12, and we must address that side of our education system, or we will ultimately undermine the greatness of our university system. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Ralph Reed. What role does the Christian coalition play in Republican politics in Georgia today? You know, it, it's tough to know. I, I would say that, you know, the, the formal organization, Christian Coalition, um, obviously doesn't exist anymore, and there are various groups, and I think they are a little bit splintered. You know, I will say, you know, in the, the gubernatorial race for, um, for myself in the runoff, um, you know, the ultra, the ultra right in particular, uh, the Georgia Right to Life, which is, um, and I'll just make no bones about it, I mean, I, I just, they are um, such a different organization from um, the Susan B. Anthony List or National Right to Life, and, you know, for someone who um, is solidly pro-life, for that organization to really come after me, and frankly, for my colleagues uh, who were my opponents in this race to you know, sign up with those types of tactics was really quite despicable. And secondly, a tremendous disservice to um, creating a true pro-life culture in this state, a tremendous service. And I will just give one example that, you know, this legislature with the individual that the Georgia Right to Life, well, all of the other candidates that they supported, I was a lone person. I mean, my gosh, they endorsed Ray McBerry? Seriously? <laughs> I mean, really, come on. Um, but, you know, we have a, a piece of legislation this go around that would have um, prohibited abortions after, I want to say, week 24, when science tells us that that's when uh, fetuses can feel pain. And that was completely stalled. Not a peep from the individual that Georgia Right to Life endorsed for the governor's race. What do you think about the new Tea Party? I think that the Tea Party is really serving a, a good purpose, and here's what I mean by that. 
I think that they are energizing um, a new group of individuals who have not particularly paid attention to the political process before. Because let's be honest, over the past decade, decade and a half, for the vast majority of Georgians and Americans, life was pretty good. You know, people earn good salaries, they could afford to buy a good house, and you know, now we hit, you know, this economic climate, and, and, you know, these individuals needed a place to sort of rally around, and whether it's a 9-12 or the Tea Party, it provided um, a new venue and a new platform for these individuals to engage. And I think it was, I'm going to say it was John Adams who said, the middle way is no way at all which I always find um, to be a very interesting and appropriate approach to government. And, and what I mean by that is this, that it is most often um, when you have very loud voices on one side or the other of an issue that really serve as a catalyst for change. And that's what the Tea Party is doing in this country, serving as a catalyst for real change around the federal budget in particular and the federal deficit in particular. And you know, that ultimately, while it might be painful sort of in the interim, the outcome of that where we reduce the debt in this nation and we get the federal budget under control will be a great, great service that, that only the Tea Party um, really served as the biggest catalyst for. Do you have any idea of how to do that? It seems we can never balance the budget or cut the debt. Is there a way? I think it takes a, a willingness to make really tough choices, throw your reelection to the wind, and be disciplined and just go in and do what is right for the country and get it done. I mean, there are so many opportunities to get cost savings, <clears throat> whether at the state level or the federal level. I mean, I was reading a report, I want to say it was on the poultry industry, about how many agencies at the federal level touch the poultry industry. Well, you know, you could in any one day have four different inspectors from various agencies show up. Is there not a way for consolidation there? Um, and I think there was just a report either this week or last week that showed for the first time in a long time the private sector is outpacing government in terms of job creation. Now that is the kind of economic spirit that the country was built on. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to your service on the, as chair of the Fulton County <laughs> As I recall, when you went into office, the county was almost broke. Yeah. And you had the great responsibility of attempting to keep it afloat. What did you do? I want to say it was about a $100 million budget deficit on a billion dollars. And, um, you know, I didn't certainly do it alone. So I had a, a great chief of staff at the time, Joy Deal, um, and another individual in the finance department, Steve Rapson. And together, I mean, we really spent, I think I can't, took office like in early November, and there was a proposed three mil tax increase on the table. And we literally spent Thanksgiving weekend, um, her at her computer, um, she lived just down the, down the street from me in Roswell, and, and uh, me over in Duluth in mine, and, and our basements working on spreadsheets for the entire Thanksgiving weekend, really just looking for everything that we could find. And, you know, we, looked at everything, nothing was off the table, absolutely nothing. And, um, you know, found that the debt service uh, fund was over leveraged and was at a mill so high it was pulling in excess funds and just any number of things and um, just made tough decisions, you know, limited some programs and put out a budget that, you know, ultimately, you know, I didn't get every single thing I wanted in the budget, but I didn't expect to. You know, part of being able to to move a body that's diverse politically the way Fulton County is, you know, you, you have to be politically astute enough to know how to negotiate to the end game. And for me, the end game was to move the county towards a balanced budget. And we did that the second year without a tax increase. And, you know, we just did it systematically. And one thing that I think was a, um, a real help in that was, one, doing five-year projections for the commission, which they had not seen before. 
um, to really see, okay, if we stay on the current path, where will Fulton County be in five years? And um, when I finished up to take over, um, take my office as Secretary of State, Fulton County had the highest cash reserves um, that it had ever had in recorded history, which clearly provided a cushion coming into the economic downturn. And again, you know, I can't take full credit because there was a lot of give and take with all of the commissioners um, on, on the body. But, you know, it took standing firm and also going out to the public and really rallying the support of the citizens of Fulton County. And they were nothing short of extraordinary in supporting uh, me and the notion that we needed to have good fiscal responsibility on that budget. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would improve government if the county and city were merged? You know, I don't know. I mean, in the end, isn't it all about the people you elect? And if you elect crappy people, you'll have crappy government. I mean, that's just how it works. Um, you know, are there some uh, benefits and cost savings that can be um, achieved? Absolutely. But whether you have a separate Milton County or a merged, you know, hybrid of Milton County and a merged remainder of Atlanta and Fulton County, regardless of the structure, the opportunity to consolidate services is there. Just look at the cities that have been created on the north side. They've done um, united consortiums around 911 and you know getting great cost savings there. They are you know combining forces on some transportation projects and specifically on the transportation spots coming up. So you know there's always multiple paths to getting things done and you know often we let I think the politics of something drive the outcome instead of really determining up front what do you want to achieve setting that out and then managing the politics around it afterwards mm -hmm. so from the county commission to secretary of state what prompted that decision that was another you know i always feel like in each of these roles i'm a rather unlikely suspect or candidate or whatever you want to call it for it. You know, I really, running for statewide was not anything on my radar screen. It would have been three and a half years for me as Fulton County Commission Chairman and really expected to just run for another term. However, there was great thought that, you know, the GOP really needed to have some uh, diversity on the ticket and um, you know, in order for that, that to happen, okay, a female, well, what woman did we have who was teed up and ready to run for statewide? And secondly, was there a woman who could even win? And so that naturally, it, whether it was me or if it would have been any other woman who was uh, chairman of the Fulton County Commission, that was just a natural go-to because of the significant population in Fulton, both in a primary and then um, in the general. And um, two positions were first discussed with me. Um, first, the PSC, Public Service Commission, and it was like, mm, no. <laughs> How many times can I say no? That's not just a no, that's a hell no. <laughs> Gosh, I can't even imagine. Bless Chuck Eaton and Bubba McDonald's heart. Love both of y'all, but you are more than welcome to that role. Um, uh, very important one that it is, but not really my bailiwick. And then, um, honestly, the, the next discussion with, with a number of folks who question, you know, rightly or wrongly, whether, um, you know, whether Casey Cagle or Ralph Reed were the right pick to be lieutenant governor, mm -hmm. um, to consider lieutenant governor. Um, and I, for a nanosecond, and said, no, that's not really, and, and here's why. You know, I don't, my background is not a legislative background. My background is very much CEO, executive management. Mm -hmm. That's what I do, I'm a problem fixer. You know, I know how to manage and run organizations, put in place a vision, and then drive the execution of that vision. And that's not necessarily skill sets. Could I do a lieutenant governor job? Sure, I like to think I could do just about anything, but I didn't feel like it was a good transition. And, you know, in the end, you know, you stack up all the numbers and, you know, everything that, that was presented to me, I probably could have won that race. But just because you can win something 
doesn't mean it's the right thing mm -hmm. for you and the best fit. And so that's when some discussions around Secretary of State, um, at that time when we were talking about it, no one on the Republican side had announced yet that they were gonna run. And I spent a lot of time researching the position what it did, all the aspects of it, to make sure that it was aligned well with my skill sets and felt like it did and off I went and who knew I'd be running <laughs> against the then sitting majority leader. Mm -hmm. um, but you won handily. I did in, in a runoff and that too was a um, very um, um, contentious, contentious race and um, with, again, a lot of the, the social issues put out there to your earlier point that, you know, Fulton County being a, um, a more Democrat, at least at that time, county, and ooh, does that mean that somehow a Republican who's elected isn't really a conservative? And no, it doesn't mean that. You know, it just means that, you know, you have to, to do your job in a little bit more of a pragmatic way, perhaps. And, um, so it was, a, it was a tough race, but yes, I think I won, I don't know, 56%, mm -hmm. something like or that. better. Yeah. You know, when you look back over uh, the history of Georgia politics, most of the Democrats prior to what year were very conservative. Mm -hmm. I would agree very with that. Very conservative. And, That's right. and uh, I think that, uh, that is uh, one reason why it took the Republican Party so long to elect a governor because most of the governors who preceded uh, Governor Purdue were extremely conservative. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, I think, you know, on, on you know, especially on the fiscal issues. I mean, mm -hmm. remember that the social issues really just started to come to the forefront for the GOP probably, you know, right, right before Governor Purdue, so late 90s. Mm -hmm. probably, you know, maybe early 90s coming up. And, you know, at, at the state level, that was really tended to be the realm of, of, you know, more fiscal issues and economic issues, more so than um, the, the social issues. Those were really sort of left to the bailiwick of, of federal Mm -hmm. federal offices and that's changed now that's changed and it, it means that the kind of the types of individuals and the backgrounds of individuals who uh, you know will be able to win in Georgia um, especially as Republicans that come through Republican primaries you know you're gonna have to be solid conservatives solid mm -hmm. conservatives let's talk about Secretary of State oh, what a great job really love that job and just a terrific group of people there Really good group. You had tremendous responsibilities. One was uh, elections. Mm -hmm. And as I recall, there was some controversy over uh, voting machines and uh, identification at the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that. Well, uh, let's start with the voting machines. Um, you know, honestly, it's just a small group of folks out there who somehow think that the electronic voting machines that were put in place by my predecessor, Secretary Cox, Kathy Cox, um, that somehow they were hackable in all of these things. And during my tenure, I never saw anything or um, got any inkling that there was any great inherent, you know, even minimum, even minimal inherent risk to the machines. And um, as part of that, we had an independent audit done of all the security processes just to do a gut check. You know, it's always good to do that every, you know, so often. And, you know, we identified a few things that we shored up, but nothing that gave me any pause or concern about um, the integrity of the elections. Um, and I think anytime you're using technology, you're going to have a small group of people who, you know, just they don't like the technology and that's kind of what we had there. With that said, you know, in the next generation of uh, voting machines, will Georgia move to something that has um, a, a greater uh, paper component to it so that you can do hard audits from it? Probably so, and, and I think all the manufacturers are working on that for next generation. Um, on photo ID, you know, I, I think as I look, other than the you know just lasting impact of building a solid, well-performing organization, that's probably the area I'm, I'm most proud of. Um, you know, photo ID, the implementation of it, languished in the courts for five, six years maybe before I got there, largely because, you know, it's one thing to have a sound piece of policy, but if you don't have 
an implementation plan to go with it, your policy pretty much doesn't mean anything because you haven't done anything with it. And that's where Georgia was in kind of a, of a, um, a stuck position. So right out of the gate, first thing there, we put in place a good solid implementation plan. And one that included, which I felt very strongly about, and I do believe that any time you make a change in your elections process, something like requiring a new set of ID, that then requires and, and um, brings with it a very high responsibility to educate voters in the state about the change. And so I'm very grateful to um, the legislature, in particular um, then Speaker Richardson, um, was very helpful in making sure that we had the funding in that first year to do the kind of communications outreach that we needed to make sure that Georgians knew what the new ID requirements were. And doing that prior to the first election where we required the ID really was um, the difference in being able to make it through the court process. Which has been done now. Yes, it's done. I think all the cases are over, and um, whichever venue it came through, all the way to the Georgia Supreme Court, it was upheld. I think there even was an, uh, um, an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which then um, the time lapsed and they did not take it up, which was no surprise because when uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, looked at Indiana's uh, photo ID law, I believe it was um, uh, Justice Breyer who said, you know, he voted no, I think, on that one, and he said, you know, if it were written like George's, I'd probably be in a different place. So we knew we were on really, really solid ground, and with that implementation process, we were um, in, in very good shape. And the 2008 presidential elections, we had uh, the highest turnout that Georgia had ever had in terms of raw numbers of voters, over four million, and, you know, there was great uh, angst among, frankly, my GOP colleagues over early voting. Um, I stand by it. If we had not had in-person early voting, there's no possible way that we could have managed four million people in mm -hmm. six days. Think about that. It's just virtually impossible to be able to run that many people through um, without tripling the number of precincts, I mean, it would have been, the cost would have tripled in order to run the presidential election had we not done the early voting. Mm -hmm. the, the, the early voting is how long? Three weeks? It's 45 days. 45 and days. one of the questions was, oh my gosh, is 45 days too long for people to come and vote? Well, we were, and I was very methodical about that date, and here's why. You're allowed to vote by mail, by absentee ballot by mail, 45 days out. Mm -hmm. And remember, Georgia still remains a Voting Rights Act state. Mm -hmm. So any change that we make in our elections laws needs to be approved by the Department of Justice. And there was so much on the record from Republicans that absentee ballot voting was a great advantage for Republicans that I knew Nobody told me this, but I knew in my heart of hearts that if I made that early voting in-person date different, period, different from the voting by mail absentee ballot, I would have a problem at DOJ. And time was too short because remember, I'm coming into office in 2007. So I only have, you know, really one more 08 legislative session to get things done. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that early voting, however, really changes campaigning. It does. Believe me, I heard about that. Yeah. But you know what? In the end, I was the Secretary of State. How people run their campaigns, as long as they aren't violating elections law, was it more onerous for them? Eh, not my problem. <laughs> right. Just completely not my problem. My single priority was to make sure that we had a voting and elections process that had high integrity and that was in the best interest of the people of this state. And if it meant that others had to run their campaigns differently, yeah, so be it. So you had no sympathy for the guy who stood on the street corner shaking hands and said, I'm running for, for <laughs> something, would you please vote for me? And the guy said, I voted last week. Not yeah. really. I mean, it, it does. and. Um, uh, you know, but it, I think it cuts both ways. Yeah. 
And you know what, the truth be told, if you, if you go and ask people, individuals who are voting early, their minds are made up and pretty much nothing that is said or done or comes out is going to change the person who really is going to go to the polls that early. And if you can vote by mail 45 days out, you can vote. So what difference does it make? I think it's a good thing. So I stand by it. I don't, you know, I know there's some talk in this session about whether or not it adds cost to the county elections offices and it really doesn't. I mean, maybe in some of the large counties where they open up multiple satellite centers a little bit more, um, but it eases the the pressure on election day, especially for presidential elections. And in the small counties, they use their current elections office anyway, so there's no added cost for them on it. What are some of the other things you did as Secretary of State? Um, setting up the um, separate and unique Office of Inspector General where we combined all of the investigative authority in the agency, which is quite vast to investigate um, elections fraud, but also securities fraud and um, some areas of consumer uh, protection and licensing fraud. And one of the things that was apparent when I came on board is that investigations were not conducted with the level of, of um, uh, uniqueness <laughs> that they should be and that often either a member of the state elections board or a member of a licensing board would call the investigating officer and want to know about the investigation and make comment about it and comment about who is being investigated, which is just wholly inappropriate. Investigation should be independent and separate from the body taking a vote around that investigation. And so um, we put a very strong, solid firewall between the licensing boards and the, the state elections board and those investigative units for myself as well because remember I chaired the state elections board and it's just not appropriate for me to engage in a conversation about the case with individuals involved in the case to then sit in, in um, judgment on the case and determine whether we're going to refer it for probable cause or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sean LaGrua um, former DeKalb Solicitor General um, ran that unit and did a, just a superb job. She's now, I'm so proud of her, she's now um, a Fulton County Superior Court Judge and um, along with our um, Elections Director Wes Taylor who um, did just a tremendous job in managing the day-to-day -day for the presidential election process as well as photo ID and any number of things. He now is a Fulton County State Court Judge and I think for anyone who has the privilege of being the manager of a, of a group of individuals, um, you know, part of your great responsibility is making sure that you know you understand that you ultimately move on, um, and your high responsibility is to build an organization with really top-notch people who can leave that lasting impression and to watch people um, who worked with me side by side go on to bigger and better things and have such an impact for the county and the state is really a rewarding thing. Mm. Very proud of them. Good. You also spoke out on ethics. Yes. Yes. Do you think that po politicians are unethical? <laughs> some. Um, and some of it is not so much I think the, the politicians themselves, I think over the course of time, uh, sometimes bad practices become so ingrained that they become the norm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's no secret that, you know, during the uh, governor's race, you know, ethics was an issue where, you know, and, and I still today, I have a great difference of opinion with with individuals in the legislature and um, even some of the, um, the my colleagues who were my opponents in the governor's race. And, you know, if you're going to put your name out there as someone running for office, whether you like it or not, you are, and you rightly should, be held to a higher standard. And um, another really just very impactful political mentor for me, Mike Bowers, uh, told me something right after I was elected Fulton County Commission Chairman. 
Um, I was really, it had, I finally had the information that the $7 million was missing from one of the funds in the sheriff's department. And here I am, you know, I'm, what, three months on the job. I don't know. I just have this uncanny knack of this is what happens with me. My husband says, somehow I must find it, but who can predict this stuff? Uh, three months into the job, and, you know, all of a sudden I have this issue with not only a sheriff, but a very powerful sheriff, the first elected African-American female sheriff in the country, and $7 million is gone. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, what's a girl to do? So I went to talk to Mike, and, and what he told me was, you know, Karen, I can't tell you what to do. But what I can tell you is that through the course of your career in politics, and he must have had a crystal ball because he thought it would be long. And he said, you're going to have any number of circumstances, and you're going to have to determine if you're going to turn a blind eye or and become part of the problem, or regardless of the personal risk to you, do whatever you can do, even if it's not within your direct authority to take action. And I opted for following his advice. And, you know, for better or for worse, I think arguably at some stages in my career, and maybe, you know, that hasn't always been helpful. But I get to put my head down on the pillow at night and I sleep very well. And so back on ethics with the legislature, you know, I still believe it is outrageous for a member of the legislature to cast a vote on a piece of legislation, including an appropriations bill, in which there are dollars set aside for a project that he or she knows that their company is going to bid on. How is that not a conflict of interest in the real world where, you know, the average Georgian is? they'd have to disclose that conflict to their employer. And I think at a minimum, the people of the state have a right to full disclosure. And um, I, I had to, to chuckle at uh, a headline in the uh, paper, I want to say over the weekend, the big story on um, pension plans and how um, it's precluded and prohibited under the Open Records Act to get certain personal information about pension plans, which by the way, I, I support. I don't know that people's personal pension info should be out there, but the idea that any legislature, any legislator is gonna stand up and say, I call for the Open Records Act to apply to that when they systematically exempted themselves, I just have a real issue with that. And you know, the executive branch is subject to the Open Records Act the legislative branch should be subject to the Open Records Act. On top of that, gift limits are needed, and it is the most illogical argument I've ever heard of to suggest that if you have a gift limit, pick a number. Uh, let's be ultra generous and make it $100. Who can't go to dinner for a really nice dinner in Georgia for $100 or less? If you can't, wow. And who would make, it's just illogical to make the argument that it would create this underground gift giving system. Do we not think that already exists? <laughs> and it's just interesting to me and it's always pre uh, preceded by the word sweeping. Every time the, there's a talk about ethics, it's always sweeping. And I think anyone would, um, who really follows the issue closely will say that and knows that we have a long way to go for having truly transparent um, government in the state of Georgia and making sure that we have the right kinds of, of ethical framework in place so that Georgians can really um, have great trust in the kinds of decisions that are being made. So I guess uh, 2009, uh, race for governor. Yeah. What prompted that one? That was a great deal of, of soul searching, um, you know, on for myself and, and, you know, first and foremost with myself and, um, and, and candidly, it sounds very trite, but, but with my faith and with God and, you know, there's just something, something as monumental as that. And it's not to say that Secretary of State and Fulton County Commission Chairman aren't big jobs, but 
governor orders of magnitude um, bigger and um, had to really sort through what did I feel like I had to to bring to the table was it the right time or would I be the right fit um, for the people of Georgia not so much with the job but for the people of Georgia and obviously with my husband uh, you know politics can it is a aware on on two people and it was a great thing to ask this man a great thing to ask him mm -hmm. to give up all that he did so that his gal could go on this great journey um, and he did for me really pretty extraordinary and, and excuse me <clears throat> and for the people of Georgia and, and during the primary what was so great is to just watch the way that and see the way people embraced him as well mm -hmm. knowing what and and truly even for uh, Sandra Deal and, and all the other spouses who were in the race it's a big thing to stand there next to uh, your spouse on all of it um, so decided to do it um, really didn't make the the hard and fast decision until um, I guess right around the end of of 09 mm -hmm. and um, then had to really oh no maybe it was 08 I'm trying to think it was a long time it felt like <laughs> it was a really long time um, but at any rate, at the end of '09, it became clear that to myself, not from anyone else because it cut both ways, that staying as Secretary of State was just not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I watched as Secretary Cox took a great deal of uh, negative uh, pressure about staying and should she have stayed, should, should she not have stayed. And, you know, I respect her opinion. She made the best one that she could at the time. And, you know, I made the best one that I could. And, you know, I very much understood that running for governor, if I really meant it and was really going to put everything into it, you can't, you can't do 200%. A human being is 100%. So something was going to have to give. And one job or the other, I would have not been giving 100% to. Mm -hmm. And that just wouldn't have been right for the people of Georgia. What sort of encouragement did you get to run? I got a encouragement from the grassroots element of the GOP. The grassroots element of the GOP. Um, there are several legislators who were very supportive of me from uh, Wendell Willard, um, uh, Edward Lindsay, um, um, you can tell it was a fairly short list of <laughs> legislators. But that's natural when you had other legislators who were running. Well, you had um, the lieutenant governor. That's right. I forgot about that. At that time, the well, lieutenant governor was the, in the race. That's right. right. That's you right. got into the race before he got out. That's right. And he was considered to be by far that's right. the front runner. But remember, there was still this uh, significant segment of the GOP that really felt that perhaps there should be another candidate. And, you know, that was sort of driving it. But again, you know, I wasn't, I will never run for anything just because I can or just because people think that maybe I can win or because the other person's not the right person. You don't run for office because of anyone else in the race. You need to run for an office because you personally, deep in your soul, have the passion and the capacity and the ability and the experience to do the job. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out all the other pieces, if you can win, et cetera. But you better have that first part right there because if you don't, you'll be eaten alive just in the process of it because mm -hmm. it is that tough. It is that tough. And um, so then once I guess I got in, then sort of the floodgates open figuring that, you know, because you had three people at that point. So you would have had Oxendine, the Lieutenant Governor, and myself, Casey Cagle and myself. And once you get three people in a race, then it's far easier, I think, for other people to get in because your chances of, of really forcing the runoff, the more people in, the greater the chance of a runoff. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, you got in the race uh, knowing that the lieutenant governor was ahead. That's right. Uh, and that didn't scare you? 
you know, I'm really not scared of much, Bob. <laughs> um, you know, you don't, you're not on your own at 17 without, the office always laughed at me because I always say, look, I have street cred. <laughs> so I know how to fight and, um, you know, did I have, I had no illusions that it would be difficult. Of course I knew it would be difficult. He was the sitting lieutenant governor. Um, but, and you he know, he didn't, he didn't own, I mean, you know, nobody. And that's the other thing. This idea that it's somebody's turn for something I have no use for that whatsoever. You don't, it's no one's turn to be in a job as important as governor or secretary of state or any of the other elected officials. It's not about whose turn it is. It's not about paying dues and all of that. It is about who is the best right person mm -hmm. for that particular moment in time to hold that job. So he withdrew. Did that hurt or help? I don't know. I hadn't ever really thought about that. Um, probably once he withdrew, more than anything, it really kind of opened up the door for a great number of people to get in. Mm -hmm. Who else got in? I can't remember. Um, Eric Johnson. Yeah. Remember, he was running for lieutenant governor. Right. And then moved over to governor. Um, um, Jeff uh, Chapman. Mm -hmm. Senator Chapman from Glynn County got in just after um, Eric Johnson got in. And then I think the last person in was then Congressman Nathan Deal. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Well, let me ask you a big general question. H how did you approach that race? What was your, what was your plan? Well, it's it fairly simple. I mean, we sketched out issues early on. We knew that, you know, frankly, with the field of candidates and, and with my background from, and I guess I didn't mention this, but other than the budget at Fulton County Commission, ushering in um, the strongest ethics policy of just about any county in the entire country for Fulton County, a county that really needed some strong <laughs> ethics policy, um, was, you know, I think, as people look back, will be one of the, the big imprints. Um, something that was done, by the way, with, in partnership and with the help of as someone who most consider my nemesis on the commission, but Commissioner Emma Darnell, proving the point that your greatest adversary today could be your partner and proponent tomorrow, um, so don't burn bridges. Um, but we knew ethics would be um, a very um, strong issue for us. Um, we had um, mapped all of that out. Um, we knew that Fulton County would be strong and looked at the numbers there and we knew what threshold I needed to take in Fulton um, to get in the runoff and what it needed to be um, in the runoff to, to win and then um, to lock up Metro Atlanta and get what I could elsewhere um, around the state, um, knowing that, and then rely on support from county commissioners, my local government connections, whether county commissioners or mayors and city council members, which has um, had a lot of support there. Um, and we knew where we wanted to come in first, where we could come in second, and where if we were third or last, you know, we could sort of put that out. And so we knew what the numbers were and what we had to do. Clearly, we wanted to, to target women um, we, we'd done polling, we knew that um, ethics um, was an issue for people. It definitely was. If I remember right in the polling, I think it was like number three. Um, and then, you know, jobs, budget, economy kind of thing, all, all one, two, and then ethics three, and then kind of the rest of the things down here. Um, and that's how we approached it. And, you know, I dedicated myself to you know, going everywhere I needed to go. If I was asked, I would go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I wasn't asked, I would still go. <laughs> Let's talk for a minute about financing a statewide mm -hmm. campaign. How do you go about raising all that money? Uh, well, we knew going into it that I would not be the top money raiser. I mean, I didn't come from a place of being able to raise a lot of money. And if you think about my base of givers coming out of Fulton County, real estate developers, which 
by then the market had totally tanked. So we knew I wasn't going to be top in fundraising. And I think, I want to say, Eric Johnson raised, raised the mo. No, Oxendine, Eric Johnson, and Nathan, I think, were tied. And I was sort of a distant fourth. Um, and fundraising, it's tough, but it's part of the job of being a candidate. And, you know, often, you know, especially for uh, women candidates, I tell them, you know, you just, there's, there's no whining in politics. I mean, there's really not. And you just have to sit there and get on the phone and call. And, you know, nobody's ever unkind to you when you call them. I mean, you know, there's always an off chance that you'll win. They're not going to be too, too mean to you on the phone. And I always had a policy. I would call someone 12 times, about 12 times before I'd really give up. And then I might only give up for maybe two, three weeks, and then I'd come back and keep calling them. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it costs a lot of money. I mean, it's expensive. Um, and you know, you've, you've got to make sure, you know, one of the considerations after you determine if you really have what it takes to do the job and to run, you have to think about if you can raise the money. Mm -hmm. Very expensive. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of high-powered endorsements. Sarah Palin, mm -hmm. Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. Did those endorsements help? Uh, Jan Brewer, Governor Brewer for Arizona? Yeah, Governor oh, I Brewer. think so. I do. You know, um, I don't think endorsements win races at all, but they help energize different segments of your voters. And, you know, there's no question, you know, that having Governor Palin come in and do that event the day before the election had a great day before the runoff, it created a lot of juice. And, you know, certainly everyone always wants to go back and second guess, you know, oh, maybe she, Karen shouldn't have had Sarah Palin. No, I should have had her because if I didn't, for every action, there is a corresponding reaction. What if I hadn't had her? Yeah. Maybe it wouldn't have been so close. Now, I don't know. I can only make the best decision that I can make in the moment with the facts that I have. And mm -hmm. we really felt, and I believe to this day, that she really helped create a lot of excitement. Remember, I still had the least amount of money, <laughs> even in the runoff. Um, and, you know, that was a lot, a lot of just flat out earned media that we didn't have to pay for, really. Mm -hmm. So election day came. Mm -hmm. You were very excited. Mm -hmm. The vote came in. Mm -hmm. You're in a runoff. Where do you go from there? You know, the runoff was, you know, just hit the ground running. I mean, we we felt like we were going to be in so, in a solid place coming into the runoff. Did not um, expect, honestly, to be first. Kind of figured it would be Nathan Deal in the second spot. Um, just wasn't really sure. Um, but when we saw the numbers coming in, we, we knew it was going to be solid that night. And um, we just, I mean, literally, we were at the office the next day at 7 a.m. I mean, there was no, I mean, we saw the initial numbers and knew we were in good shape. We started planning that night, you know, in the suite. I mean, we were working, working already. Did you change your tactics? No. We stayed the course. We knew, and there was, you know, debate whether or not, you know, the, the first male piece should be about ethics. And remember at that point, the ethics issues of, of uh, Congressman Deal were starting to come out. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it didn't, I mean, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where he was going to hit me on. And he did. He came right at me from, from the far right and wanted to out conservative me. And um, we knew that if we didn't hit the ground running, defining me first, we could not allow him to, his campaign, to first define me. And so we were out of the gate with a male piece that um, he didn't like. I wouldn't have liked it either, but I completely stand by it. It was an issue in the debates, and here's why I stand by it. It was 100% factual. And for all the talk about, quote, negative campaigning, if it's the facts, that's the facts. If it's untruths, that's where it becomes negative campaigning. It's how I define it. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it was the headlines of all the various newspaper articles over the past 
you know, about a month, I guess it was. Um, and it was, it was pretty devastating. And, you know, I was always, you know, it's ironic that, you know, the issue of negative campaigning was such an issue when arguably the two most negative individuals throughout the entire gubernatorial race were John Oxendine and Nathan Deal. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about John yeah. Oxendine. The polls uh, uh, throughout the most of the year showed him very much ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think happened to his campaign? People got to know him. The negative, uh, his negative image. I, I just think that the more he was out there, you know, there's a great thing about, you know, the genuineness of a candidate and the likability factor. And it's not something you can really create. And, and I think that for uh, Commissioner Oxendine, and, and he and I have chatted since the, the, the election, and I hope he's doing really well. I hear he's doing well, and, and his wife Ivy is just a terrific, uh, terrific individual. But, you know, it's just the more that he was out there, I think that created less and less support for him, and, and then the ethics issues that he had. Well, the results of the runoff was uh, very close. Yep, they were. It was it was in inside the uh, recount. About a half margin. a percent. Yep, recount. And anything you, less than one percent. And you you didn't want to recount. Uh, why wouldn't you want to recount? Well, a couple of things. You know, first of all, you know, while it was less than a half a percent difference, um, twenty five hundred votes with, I mean, and I really believe it. I believe in the integrity of Georgia's elections system. I mean, I lived it and breathed it for three and a half years, and um, that's a big vote swing, to do a recount and have the vote swing by 2,500 votes. Um, the second thing, you know, I wasn't going to just go through the motions of it, and just because. And I suppose maybe in hindsight had I done that, the additional ethics issues maybe would have come out and what would have happened, I don't know. Um, but I can only do the best right thing, as I've said, in the moment that I have to do it. And what I knew was the following, that for the Republican Party, you know, obviously this election was a virtual tie. We mm -hmm. were a very divided GOP mm -hmm. that Wednesday morning. And it would have served no purpose for the GOP, but more importantly, it would have been a gross disservice to the people of the state for me to prolong that whole process. Mm -hmm. And knowing what I knew as Secretary of State, that the likelihood of a 2,500 vote swing was next to impossible. Well, you, well, I guess you and Kathy Cox broke the ice. I think so. Uh, I think so. How long do you think it will be before Georgia will elect a woman governor? I think it's going to be soon. And, you know, that was another thing, you know, for, for the race. A lot of people would say, oh, gosh, do you think that being a woman is going to be hard for you to get, you know, the guy vote, the South Georgia guy vote, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't. I mean, I met people who got emails on Election Day. Karen, I just wanted you to know, I voted for you for governor, and you are the first woman I have ever voted for, ever. Mm -hmm. And I think my observation around what has changed a little bit is, you know, we have a generation of, in, of men in our state that when they, the first woman that they compare other women to most likely would be their wives. Mm -hmm. And probably not an individual that they would necessarily see as governor. But now they have daughters, granddaughters, and even great granddaughters who are making their way, whether it be in the corporate world or the political world or the nonprofit world, et cetera, in really high profile, high, 
high, hot, hard charging, you know, top notch CEO positions. And so the whole mindset around who can be governor has changed because I don't think there's a daddy out there who would not stare down another man who says, I am voting for a woman if it was his daughter running, right? right. And I think that has really helped. That's just the natural um, sort of evolution that happens over the course of time. And this state, um, I think in, in our lifetimes, we will see a woman governor of the state of Georgia. You plan to run for governor again? No, oh, I don't know. Bob, you know that politics has a unique timing and you don't get to pick your timing. Politics sets a timing and what I'll say is that I'm going to stay involved. This is my state, my home. I love it and I'm going to stay involved and make sure that we are moving forward for Georgia and if an opportunity comes along I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. What do you think about these eight-year terms? Meaning to the two four years? I mean, I think there's a lot of things that are tough to get done in the first four years if you're planning to run for re-election. Um, you know, had I been governor, I, I would not have approached it that way. I would have been pedal to the metal yeah. for the first four years. And if it meant the things that needed to be done for Georgia, if it meant not being re-elected, yeah, take my chances with that. Well, looking back over your career, political career, mm -hmm. which may or may not be over. <laughs> Is there anything you would have done differently? I don't think so. I'm not a person who spends a, a lot of time looking in the, in the rear view mirror. I just, you know, I, I hope that, um, that I'll be recalled for being strong on ethics and getting things done in the roles that I had and, you know, it doesn't serve a whole lot of purpose. In fact, it was Sonny Perdue who, um, after the runoff, said, you know, Karen, have the discipline, and anyone who knows me knows I'm fairly disciplined, have the discipline to not go back and, you know, just digress into every little minutia that you have um, mm -hmm. to rethink everything. And, you know, I'm a great believer that very much God has a plan mm -hmm. and you don't get much closer than, you know, half less than half a percent. So I believe it just wasn't quite meant to be, wasn't my time, and that's how I look at it, and I'll be looking forward instead of back. What do you consider your greatest accomplishment? Well, I mean, it was certainly an achievement to have ethics reform at Fulton and get the budget balanced and to do photo ID and, you know, consolidate things in the Secretary of State's office. But I think the greatest accomplishment is, you know, when you can build a team of really top-notch individuals because you're only there for your time, whatever job you have, whether it's in the private sector or the, or the in the world of politics, you're only there for a certain amount of time and you need to build a kind of team that can be high productive and high performing over the long haul. And I think that's what I am most proud of, particularly for the Secretary of State. I mean, Vincent Russo, who's the young general counsel there, Wes Taylor, who was the elections director and now a judge, Sean LaGrua, who's now a judge. Um, uh, Randy Vaughn down in the licensing division and the reorganization that we did there really put things in place that weren't just one-time initiatives um, that you know one politician or another could stamp their name to but they were lasting things in the people in the people who were there and that's besides those 2,500 votes what do you consider your your uh, biggest disappointment? I think, hmm, gosh, I think probably at, at a lot of it, some of it's tactical and some of it will be bigger. From a, a tactical standpoint, I think, you know, it, not being able to do more at Fulton on, on the road, road and transportation, just very difficult to move things there. Um, you know, I think generally in, in my professional world, I don't have that many disappointments um, in life. My biggest disappointment was 
not being able to have a family with my husband. Mm -hmm. One other question. If, uh, if you were asked to name the one individual who most influenced your political life, who would that be? Mm. I think there would be two. I have to have a tie. One, Ray Evans, um, who is a person who first exposed me to the true world of politics. I mean, I always, you know, was involved in politics, but, you know, she really influenced me to be involved and to participate in campaigns and, and things of that nature, which is, you know, a good thing when you're that young to drive that out. Um, philosophically, Ronald Reagan, and I have to also say Mike Bowers from an ethics standpoint, someone who really underscored my unique responsibility um, in being an elected official is that you are and should expect and hold yourself to a higher standard than others. Well, I think you know that you're the poster girl for Georgia politics now. What, <laughs> what, advice, what advice would you have for young ladies who wish to get involved in politics? Oh, I think the first thing they can do is, you know, go out and research candidates and get involved with an individual that you can have a good passion for and, and be involved. And then once you are involved, stay in touch with them. I mean, my whole cam the whole campaign team, we still stay in touch from the governor's race. I mean, there's a nucleus of us, of about eight of us who stay in touch. Um, go out and get some good practical work experience. Um, obviously, you know, pursue your college degree. You know, it's mm -hmm. a whole different world now than when I was 18. You, you just, you must have that, you know, coming into the work world now. But get some real practical experience. And then if you have an interest in politics, get involved at the local level. There's all kinds of, of commissions and committees and um, your elected officials, whether it be your state rep or senator or your county commissioners or city council folks, they have all kinds of opportunities where you can be involved. And then get involved in the political party whichever side of the aisle you end up on, get involved and stay involved at a young age, at a young age. We'd like to close by having our guests tell us anything that we might have missed about you and your life and your career. Oh gosh, I think you were really thorough, Bob, and I'll just end by saying I have been extraordinarily fortunate in my life and that I had the opportunity to serve the people of Georgia and to even run for governor, let alone be governor, just the opportunity to run for governor has genuinely not only enriched my life, but my husband's.